last skyrocketed up when I was started using AI for learning, and it's uh, really helps me to learn. Nice. Yeah, we've brought our first AI specialist onto the Oncom team, and it's it's been it's been really good. It's been really interesting. Eugene has a, a lot of different abilities, but uh, he's he's bringing that stuff to us. So looking forward to this conversation. I know you know uh, Dave O'Brien as well. While you're setting, yeah, this up. Um, yeah. Dave and I have been talking about you, you and your your work as well. And so yeah, this uh, would be great if we can ever digitalize Dave's brain and knowledge. A, a oh, it's, more. yeah, yeah. That's that's something that he and I spoke a little bit about. And and funnily enough, I was just connecting with someone else yesterday who's kind of intertwined in that as well. And I think it's something we're going to really push hard and work on because there's just. You know, I don't I, know, I don't know how you feel about this, but me personally, from personal experience, have found that so many practitioners in the health coaching, functional health space, they're just ill-equipped. And people like Dave and, and a few others are really like they're one in a million. And to be able to to be able to equip other practitioners with their level of knowledge and their depth of expertise would just be so impactful. And it's definitely something I'd love to build. Yeah, either either teaching that to other coaches or making his service more available and that knowledge more available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to this discussion. I can see that most are using some uh, chat GPT or, or playing around with things. Welcome to use the chat box as we go through as well, man. Questions, observations, um, and yeah, let's let's dive in. Cool. Can you uh, can you see the screen? Yeah, yeah, this is good. We can still see the top and that as well. If you can go full screen, I don't know. But it, uh, either way. I actually don't know how to do it in this application. Uh, it's probably, in, yeah, you're in a... Um, so basically what I wanted to take you guys through is is um, a little bit of fundamentals about how these things work. And then from there, we can kind of extrapolate into what we can do and, and some of the challenges that come up when we're building applications or custom applications with um, AI models like GPT. Um, so basically when I'm trying to put something together for a mixed group like this, I'm aware some of you will have a lot of experience with AI, some of you very little, um, and some of you very little on the technical side. Um, I guess all I would say is, is I've tried to kind of add something that will be helpful for, or, or at least someone will be able to take something away. Everyone will be able to take something away. So don't worry if, um, don't worry if it starts a little basic. And then also at the end, don't worry if you you get a bit lost. Like it, there's a lot to learn in this space. Um, and I'm always happy to connect as well and, and fill people in more. And, and um, yeah, we'll just, we'll see how it goes. So yeah, this is going to be an introduction to building AI driven applications. I'm sure you've all used ChatGPT. I'm sure you've all used a plethora of the applications that are out there available. But what I wanted to talk about today is really how we can start to, um, feed GPT or other language models our own knowledge to get kind of customized experiences. Um, so just to start off a little bit about how large language models work under the hood in the, the most basic sense. So you have a user and they provide some uh, some prompt and the prompt here is just the sky is, is our prompt. We're sending that in this case to GPT. GPT is trained on, on a whole bunch of training data. Obviously, this is a simplified diagram. There's a lot that goes into this training side of things. But for now, just think GPT has access to its training data. And based on all of the training data available to it, it says, what is the next most likely word? And that is all these models are doing. They might, might seem like total magic, but all they're ever doing is saying, what is the next most likely word given the prompt that the user has put in? So in this case, it says the next most likely word is gray. And obviously I've made these percentages up and, and these words up, but the percentages here represent how likely the model thinks gray is the next is the next word in this sentence. And it's, it's assimilating all of that from its training data. Um, and then obviously it continues on. So the sky is gray and then the next most likely word is in the next most likely word england and uh, again it's doing all this from the training data what you can see though in this example is that um in this case in the middle kind of instance 
it's not picked the most likely word because it saw that today, in fact, was the most likely word. Um, but it, it kind of picked one that was close to the most likely word. And that that's kind of a parameter we can play with called temperature. Um, and it does this, the models do this to make sure that they don't always give the exact same answer to the exact same prompt so it feels a bit more living um, and that's a parameter we can play with obviously if you're working with medical data for example or fitness data things like that you want that temperature very close to zero you want the model to be as deterministic as possible you want the truth you don't want it to be creative and playful um so ultimately, I'd, so far, I've told a little bit of a lie in that I've said that the model is always saying, what is the most likely next word? The reality of what they're doing is they're saying, what's the most likely next token? And a token is basically just, it can be a word, but it can also be a fragment or a section of a word. So this is, I've put some, some text from Uncom into the OpenAI tokenizer, which basically just shows you how those words get split up into tokens. And you can see here, most of the words, are to, uh, most of the tokens are a full word, um, but upgraded, for example, it's split that into two tokens. It's split the up and the graded. Um, and then these numbers underneath, uh, just, just a, a representation of this is how the models actually see each word or each token, I should say. So what is seen by the model as 2061, et cetera. Um, and so you can see that this sentence, although it's kind of, it's, it's I don't know, 11 words, it's, it's kind of put out as 12 tokens or 10 words to 12 tokens because it's treated the question mark as a token and it's treated upgraded as two. Um, so they're just building blocks of words that models understand. They get converted into these numerical values. Um, there's all kinds of to tokenizing methodologies. It's quite technical, but this is the most common one, these sub-word tokenizers. Um, on average, you can think of one token as being equal to about 0.75 of a word. Um, and if you ever want to play with this, I'll send the link to this uh, this whole presentation afterwards, by the way. I can put it in the AI channel or something. Um, but if you ever want to play with that, you can go to this link and you can see exactly how the tokenizer splits up text. So when we're trying to build custom experiences with ChatGPT or, or GPT or other LLMs, um, and I'm sure you've run into this as well, but one of the limiting factors um, is the context window. The context window simply put means how much text can I put into a given prompt and then get back in, in the form of a completion. There's a limit on that. And I'm sure, I'm sure many of you have run into that if you've tried to paste a giant document into chat GPT or, or, or anything else and it just goes, hey, this is too much content. I don't know what to do with it. And, and that is based on the context window limitation. So this is just a visual representation of that. The prompt here is what's the best thing about blockchain technology answer in 30 words or less. That's 15 tokens worth of content in the prompt. The completion it comes back with, I won't read out the whole thing, but that was 35 tokens. So in this example, the size of our, our context window is 50 tokens. And um, all of the different models, they'll have different limits for how, how big that context can be. Um, ChatGPT right now, I believe it's 12,000 tokens or thereabouts. I'd have to double check that. Um, but there are other models, like there's a, there's a new GPT 32K, which is um, not everyone has access to yet, but that can do 32,000 tokens. This really is the limiting factor of, as you'll see shortly in what we can build. Um, I wanted to take a very quick aside and just talk a little bit about prompting in general. Um, and I'm going to kind of speed through this just to make sure there's time to get through everything. But there are lots of different prompting uh, tactics and methodologies. Um, and, and what I would say, if you want to take anything away from this, this presentation, um, one thing that I think everybody should be doing is just learning about prompting and prompting tactics and, um, and strategies. Um, those So like understanding the difference between what's a zero shot prompt, what's a few shot prompt, what's thinking steps, plan and solve, and, and understanding prompt injection, all of these 
things are, are really important. I won't extrapolate on them too much now, um, but just to say that there are different strategies for working with these prompts. Um, this is a, an example of a paper that came out um, read it earlier this year. Um, there was a, a prompting strategy called Plan and Solve, which had been shown to be quite effective. Um, this paper came out earlier this year and just showed that um, actually um, or oh, sorry, think and think step by step used to be very uh, a popular tactic. This paper showed that plan and solve actually outperforms that quite dramatically. And, and these papers are really interesting. And I, I'd highly encourage anyone to read some of these prompting related papers because they're not overly technical. They're, they're quite easy to get your head around with no kind of technical background. And they really do give you an edge over everybody else in the space who's just like winging it, trying to come up with prompts on the fly. Um, these papers are just an amazing source of knowledge. So I've linked that here. And again, I'll, I'll share that. And uh, one of the other really interesting things when we think about prompting and, and building things with large language models in general is model drift. So over time, as these models are changed and, and they're improved in quotation marks, the models will drift and they'll start to react differently to the same prompts because the underlying model has changed. This paper came out very recently and actually showed that um, since, since earlier this year to June, um, the, the kind of effectiveness of these models at answering uh, basic, basic mathematical questions, uh, producing code that is that runs, um, actually has decreased significantly. These models are getting a lot worse over time at a number of different tasks. And what they're getting better at is being politically correct and being woke, for lack of a better word. And as we're kind of like adding human layers of, oh, you shouldn't say this, you shouldn't say that, or you need to say this, you need to say that, it's actually drastically un un affecting the underlying model and their ability to perform, which I, I find really fascinating. And I think it just goes to show that when you're trying to teach a model to actually ignore reality in some cases, it starts to ignore reality everywhere and get things wrong. Um, so I just think that's a really interesting, again, link to the paper that I'll share later. Um, I just wanted to share this uh, website, it's promptingguide.ai. Um, it's a good website in general for just learning more about the technical side of how to create good prompts. Um, and they also have a papers resource that they update regularly just about good, good kind of papers in the prompt engineering space. Um, so yeah, just a quick aside on prompting. And we're back to our context window and its limitation. Um, you can see that what's happening in the space right now is there is a war to kind of create the model with the biggest amount of context. So here's GPT-4. Uh, I was wrong. It takes 8,000 tokens, not, not 12. Um, here's GPT-4, 32K, which is like their new model they're working on, 32,000. Um, this is a, a model called Claude from a from a um, a company called Anthropic. Um, again, not many people have access to this at the moment, but it's coming. But they've already created this 100,000 um, con uh, token context window, which, as you'll see later, just dramatically improves the abilities of what we can do with these models. And here's a, just a snippet of another paper that's a bit more technical, but. It's a, uh, a theoretical architecture that people have um, worked out and how we can scale these things to a million tokens or more. Um, so this, this is going to be the, the big thing. All of these people making models are racing to increase the context window size. Um, and there's a lot of similarities between context window size and RAM or memory in your computer. You can think about it very similarly because it operates in a similar way. It provides a similar function. It gives the model memory or information that it can sort of have in its mind at any one time. Um, the same way RAM in your computer provides a memory that, that, that a program can look to and work with. And I just thought this was funny. This is an advert from, I don't remember how long ago, back in the day, a long time ago. And it says the 16K RAM card that turns your computer into a working giant. Um, the reality is that 16K of RAM um, is actually 32 million K, um, or sorry, 32 million K is what the computer I have right now is using. So you can see how over a span of, I don't know, 15, 20 years, I can't remember when this advert is from, this, these things grow exponentially. And the same thing is going to happen with the context window with large language models. Um, so I'm sure you've all found that ChatGPT is amazing for just so many use cases. 
but sometimes we need kind of two extra things. We need specificity. So the, the ability for the model to work on a very specific data set and, and for us to know that that's where the answers are coming from. And we also need confidence. Um, we need confidence that the models are telling us the truth because they, they are very prone to hallucination. If they don't know an answer, um, if they can't complete the prompt based off the data they know, they'll just make something up because that's all their job is to do. It's to complete the prompt, complete the sentence that's been provided to it. Um, but LLMs, in more broadly, they provide this amazing reasoning engine that we, we can use on our own data that we know is true or that we know is, is correct. Um, and there's lots of use cases for this. And the most kind of simple of those, which we're going to look into a bit today, is kind of question and answer style chat bots. Um, but there's all kinds of other applications that can be built using LLMs and agents and all kinds of other stuff, which I'm sure we can talk about another day. Um, so when you're thinking about chatting with your own data, and especially a large amount of data, you run into this problem, which we've alluded to already, because all that all we need to provide to the model when it's coming up in an answer has with an answer has to fit within this context window, the limitation of tokens that it can take in. So the developer of this application might provide some specific instructions that has to be fed into every prompt. Those set of instructions might be, uh, I mean, in this case, we're working with a, this example. I'm looking at a, a thousand page textbook. So the developer's instructions might be, hey, you are a... Um, you are a medical and anatomical expert. You've got a load of data about a, a medical textbook and you're going to get a question from a user. Your job is to answer the user, blah, blah, blah. It's just some instructions for the, the um, LLM. The user then comes in with a question. So they might say, um, where is epithelium found, found in the body? Um, and what we then need to do is provide, if we're working with our own data, we need to provide that data into the context window so the model has that data to work with. So in this case, a thousand page textbook is, you know, 250 to 300,000 words. So we're looking at about 400,000 tokens or thereabouts, which clearly isn't going to fit in our context window. So you get this over overlaying error here, like it doesn't fit. Um, so we need to think of another strategy. We can't just paste the whole textbook in and say, you know, give us an answer to this question. Um, one potential solution to this is fine tuning a model, which you, is a term you might have heard. It's about taking an underlying model like GPT and uh, teaching it over time with some kind of machine learning tactics, um, how to respond to certain questions. The challenge with fine tuning is it's extremely expensive. It's very, very time consuming. You need, you need highly specialized machine learning knowledge. Um, and more often than not, you end up making the model worse. That's what most people end up doing is they try and fine tune, the model gets worse and your, your kind of output isn't, doesn't come out right. Um, Another solution is to use this kind of searching, retrieving, embedding vector store strategy. And I know these are really big words, and I think this is where things might get a little more technical, but ultimately the, the concepts are relatively simple. So what happens with um, vectorization, embeddings? We take our source material. So in this case, again, we've got this thousand page textbook. We split it into really small chunks. So we split it into like um, chunks of a thousand, uh, a thousand characters, let's say, or, or you know, 200, 250 words, something like that. Um, those chunks get converted into this really interesting data format called um, called an embedding, which are basically just str like long strings of numbers, um, and we'll explore those more in a little bit. But basically, that it gets converted. Each chunk gets converted into one thousand five hundred and thirty-six numbers, and those are things that the the models can understand very well. And they get stored in a special database called a vector store. So, um, like I said, the, these embeddings end up becoming numerical representations of data, and they capture the meaning of the underlying chunks of data. Um, so they they capture meaning and relationships in a way that these models can understand. And they, what's so interesting about them is, is a little bit nerdy, I suppose, but they represent words in this dimensional space. Um, the, and the closer two words are to one another, the more similar in meaning or contextually relevant they might be. Um, but you have to remember, we're looking from uh, like these 1,536 angles. So something that kind of illustrates this, um, 
each dimension, and again, there's 1,536 of them, represents some angle of meaning. So you might see that it, from one angle, this angle here, um, kitten and puppy are similar things. You see they've both got this dimension by which they're, they're, they have a similar numerical representation. That, new, that dimension might be their age, you know, kittens and puppies are similar by the, the kind of age relationship they have. And a panther in this case is the odd one out. It doesn't fit in with that relationship. But if you look at those these three words from another dimension, you could say um, kitten and puppy are actually very different, but a kitten and panther are both very similar because they're you know they're both felines. That's another angle of meaning from which we can look at things. Um, and basically, the the models are doing this so that they can the, the, we can get the highly relevant pieces of data to our question, and we can feed that into the model alongside the question in a way that stays within the context window, and we get some kind of novel answer back. I just wanted to show you very quickly. Um, this is a, a kind of gra graphical representation of the same thing I was just talking about. So these dimensions or angles of meanings. So you can see the kind of the groupings of dots. All of the red dots are animals. All the green ones are athletes. All of the blue ones are films. And all the purple ones are transportation. And the pink ones are villages. So if we hover over a village here, so Fiorina is in is a curacy. It's located in San Marino. It belongs to the mu uh, municipality of Domenango, etc. And you can see um, here, God, they're really giving me some difficult words to say. So cyana is a moth of the, you know, you get the idea. These are all different things. But what we, and you can see by this sort of default angle, they're all grouped very closely together. So all the villages are similar in meaning, all the athletes are similar in meaning, et cetera. But if we change the angle, the dimension from which we're looking at this data, you can see there's like here, you've got the Hotel Chelsea, in, is somehow similar in meaning to the Yamaha RX100 motorbike. Like it's found some relationship between those things, um, which I just think is, is really interesting. Um, and so what we're doing here is we we provide the we provide some query to our vector store where all of these kind of number representations of our data are stored. Um, the the like to, to put a long story short, we we put the query into the vector store and it pops out with relevant data that we have chunked and embedded. So the relevant data from dog might be puppy, pet, wolf, um, and it gives that all back to us. And again, this might seem really complicated and it's kind of hard at first glance to see why that's helpful, um, but it does a number of things for us. It, it, one, it provides us a, a whole new way of performing searches, um, not just for large language models, but more broadly, because if you if you take a, like a, a, a your everyday website and you, you put in this thing, like, I, I don't know, maybe it's an e-commerce website and I want to buy a cup like you're going to get back results that say the word cup, right? Like that's just how searching has always worked. But what with this kind of approach, we can actually search based on meaning rather than language. So I could say, um, I want a container of fluids and it will still give me back all of the results that are cups from this store, right? It's just a, a intro, even if they don't say the words container, fluids, et cetera. Um, but where this gets really powerful is when we're working with our custom data and we're, we're kind of trying to provide it relevant information to fit within the within the context window. So when we ask our, our kind of chatbot a complicated question, that question itself is converted into these kind of number representations of meaning searched against our store of all of our um, kind of data that we're working with. And we can use that to search um, for relevant chunks of information that, um, that yeah, fit with the question that are being asked. And now what we have is a handful of excerpts and snippets from our source data that are highly relevant to the question that's been asked. And ultimately we can pass them to the, the large language model along with the question and say something like, hey, here's a question from a user. Here is, here is some highly relevant information upon which you can use to answer the question. Um, so tying it all together and again, 
apologies if this is a little um a little condensed and, and complicated i'm really conscious of time so i'm trying to keep this quite uh moving quite quickly and again i'm always happy to extrapolate on this stuff with people but basically we have this this architecture for a chatbot that can talk with an a thousand page tech textbook we have some ingestion process where the book is converted into chunks it's stored as these numerical representations of meaning in our vector store. Um, we then have a user who asks a question, what is epithelium? Um, that then is converted also into these numerical chunks, uh, oh, sorry, these numerical representations of meaning. We have a retriever that goes to our vector store and says, hey, give us some relevant excerpts from this textbook as embeddings, which it does. Um, and then, our context window. So what actually ends up getting sent to the to the model, and you could literally just copy paste this and put it into chat GPT. You could say you're an AI educational assistant, you're given the following extracted parts of text of a textbook on anatomy, health and nutrition, as well as a user question, provide a detailed answer based on the context provided. If the question isn't related to the context, politely respond, you're tuned only to answer questions that are related to anatomy, et cetera. So we're just telling it not to make up an answer and only to use the stuff that it knows about. Um, the question gets passed in, what is epithelium? And based on what came back from the vector store, we provide these three highly relevant examples from the textbook. And you can see all of the tokens along the way. We're adding up these tokens and we've got a prompt, which is as low as 841 tokens from a thousand page textbook. And you pass that into GPT, GPT comes back with an answer. So epithelium is a type of tissue, blah, blah, blah. It comes up with a really kind of complicated or, or well thought through answer that synthesized all of the knowledge you've provided to it. And it's done so in this case in just a thousand tokens. Um, and so that's kind of like, that's the way that some of these, these AI chatbots that you might have played with work under, under the hood. And even ChatGPT itself does this in different ways when, for example, you have a really long conversation history with it. Um, it actually uses some of these embedding strategies on your conversation history. So that when you ask it something like, um, you know, there's a follow on question from something 10 questions ago, it still is able to go, oh, yeah, I remember when you said this thing. Um, it doesn't actually remember. It's just using some of this um, embedding retrieval kind of tactics to, to sort of pretend that it remembers the conversation. Um, one other thing that I haven't mentioned about before, which is worth keeping in mind, is the way that um, OpenAI and other models charge you when you're building applications is they charge you per token. So it's another incentive to keep these kind of prompt completion pairs as small as possible in terms of the amount of tokens, because otherwise cost starts to run away with itself. Like if you're using the full eight, 9,000 tokens of, of the GPT allows you to work with every time you ask it a question, you're probably going to be spending near enough to a dollar every time you ask a question via the API. Um, so it's just another consideration. This, uh, this example, obviously, is quite a simple example. It's still very exciting, I think, to be able to work with your own data in this way, um, but it's ultimately quite a simple use case. And there's, there's a lot of other things that you can kind of layer in and on top of um, these kinds of applications to make them more interesting. Like you can do pre-processing on the data, post-processing on the answers. Um, you can kind of um, have multiple large language models that are all chained together and have different functions. Um, and, and ultimately, just having chat, chat is just one use case, but really we can do other things like working with databases, we can, um, you know, we can make an automated sales bot trained on our exact methodology of how we sell to people, and actually our sales transcript history, so it can pretend to be us based on all of the kind of data it has, there's so many different use cases for this. Um, but that's essentially it for, for kind of like a, a just a, a primer on how some of this stuff works. And I wanted to show a quick example of something I was just playing with over the weekend for you guys. Um, so this is a, a chat bot that I've put together. Um, and basically what I've, what I've used to feed into this model using the exact strategy that we've just gone over is the course content from Paul Council's courses in Uncom. Um, so basically I've taken all the video content from, um, from the, not the elite, sorry, my mind's just gone blank. The, the, 
I've forgotten the names of the courses. We'll find them in a minute, but one of them is Spiral Dynamics and one of them is another course that's in Uncom by Paul Council. So I can ask this thing a question. I might say, how do I become financially free? And it doesn't matter that I've, it shouldn't matter that I've <laughs> made a spelling error there. Um, so becoming financially free involves a few key steps. Understanding value. The first step is to truly understand the concept of value. This is not about multiplying numbers, but about multiplying value. You need to protect the value of the money you're already earning and think about how you can multiply it. Avoid socially engineering loss making. You need to move away from the traditional world of socially engineered loss making. This means you need to think differently, etc. So you can see anyone who's um, taken Paul's course in Uncom can see that this is very much um, tailored to his way of doing things. It's using his specific language, his tone. Um, and yeah, it's coming up with quite a nice, long and detailed answer. It's actually going, this is slower than it normally operates, but we'll uh, we'll give it a minute to finish. So once it's come up with this answer, what we can actually do now is see um, what it used to come up with this answer. So you can see that all of the different embeddings that came back from the vector store, um, one of them was from Intro to Money and Wealth from the course, um, from Introduction to Money and Wealth. And, uh, oh, this was from part one, sorry. And here you can see the exact excerpt that it was kind of taking into account. This is the text from the video itself um, that it's kind of using to synthesize this answer. And again, you can see it's looking to other videos now. It's looking to Intro to Money and Wealth, part two. Um, most of them seem to have come from those two videos. And, you, and, and again, you can see it's just a small snippet, um, just small snippets from each of these videos that it's used. And then from there, if I wanted to, I can click on this and, you know, I can watch the video that it's talking about. Um, one thing I didn't do just because I didn't have time to build this in over the weekend, because it's a bit, bit of a bigger undertaking, is you could actually get it so that it even gives you back the timestamp from where in the video it was saying this. And then when you clicked, it could take you straight to that small segment of the video so you could watch the relevant content in its detail. And obviously we could go um, we could go more into detail here. So you could say, tell me more about, um, about socially engineered loss making. Um, and it will do the same thing. It'll go back to those vectors. It will look for um, look for more detailed answer that's very specific to what I've just asked it. And you can see here, it's kind of really extrapolating on what socially engineered loss making is and how it can affect us and how it's related to the economy and consumerism and all of this stuff. Um, but yeah, that's the little demo that I just wanted to show you of what's possible. And again, um, I've, I've done this a lot before for kind of companies that are looking to work with their data in very specific ways. Um, so I can do this stuff quite quickly, but, but this kind of took me, you know, an afternoon over the weekend to just like ingest a bunch of videos, play with the prompt a little bit to make sure it's doing things the right way. Um, and here you have this actually what ends up being quite a powerful tool. Um, so yeah, that's kind of it for my presentation side of things. And, and I wonder if maybe we should, Keegan, I can throw it back to you, or we can open open up for some questions. Yeah, very, very cool. Very impressive. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And uh, how long did it take you to be able to perform that, uh, to set that up around Paul's stuff? Yeah, literally. So uh, the, the thing is, I've done it a lot before. So I'm using a lot of borrowed code that I've used on other projects and things like that. Um, but this specific one, it took me like an afternoon. I did it on Sunday, basically, just to get Paul's um, Paul's content in there and 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 tweak the prompt a little bit. And um, yeah, just make sure it was working the way I wanted it to work. But, yeah, How many videos is it? Is it pulling from the EMC is like his longer 12 month course? Yeah, and I didn't didn't do that one just purely because it's quite long and it would have taken me a bit longer to work on. I did the other the other two. So the spiral dyma dynamics, which I think is about six videos off the top of my head. And then the intro to money and wealth, which was I think six to eight as well. So yeah. Yeah. What where like where do you see this going for you know? I mean, it's probably easiest to speak to uncommon success, but for people looking at watching this as well they're thinking about how it's going to impact their businesses like what, yeah. what impact do you see it having it's so so much impact i mean you've you've probably all heard the kind of fear mongering around like you know we're going to be replaced by ai so like ai is going to take our jobs 
I don't think that's true, but I think there's a, a kernel of truth in that, which is that um, it's not that your job is going to be taken by AI, it's that your job is at risk of being taken by someone who knows how to use AI really well. Um, and, and also your kind of business is at risk of being beaten by a business that knows how to use AI really well. Um, and so I think that's that's really worth considering. Um, and also just recognizing we're so early in this stuff that it just pays to like be asking the questions. Like when you see something like this, just ask the questions. How could this be relevant for me? How could this be useful for me? And even if you don't know how to do it technically yet, it's worth just thinking about these ideas and as kind of like the, the second layer to that, I think is we all have such a unique kind of like take on the world or on our work, on our profession. Like we all have value in just the things we know and the things that we um, see. And I think it's really worth thinking about how can I structure some kind of data that represents my knowledge? Like even if that's just getting a load of stuff in Notion, getting a load of stuff in these kind of note-taking platforms that represents all of the things you know and know how to do well and your knowledge set. Because at some point in time, you're going to be able to leverage that in a really um, easy way to produce something super powerful. And the, the people that do that first are going to be are going to be the winners. And that's why like I think it's so exciting to be able to think about, okay, if you've got this amazing health coach, he can only help three, four people a day when he's hopping on calls. But if you can get all of his collective knowledge into a model that knows how to use it, where you can just say like, hey, here's what I'm struggling with. Here are my symptoms. I had some blood work done. This is what the blood say. Like, what do you think I should do? And then it kind of uses that all of that knowledge that someone has um, to synthesize an answer for you, a plan for you. And that's really powerful. It's really powerful from a business perspective. It's really powerful from like a human empowering, being able to get good advice in an accessible way. Um, I also just think it's it's important to think about what what kind of opportunities are there for automation in my business. And, and again, even if you don't know how to build them, just think creatively about how could you possibly do it in the future? Because it will get your head in the right place. So for example, um, one of the things I like my kind of little pet ideas I've been playing around with is uh, for you guys as coaches, I'm sure that you're getting a lot of leads um, and spending a lot of time on platforms like Instagram, Facebook, wherever else, just sort of DMing people with the goal of, you know, getting them onto an actual phone call with you so you can make the the, the real sell. Um, and if you've got enough historical data of you doing that, like I know, Keegan, you and I spoke on Instagram, right? We spoke via DM and ultimately we kind of arranged a call. Um, but if you have enough historical data of that uh, uh, over time, you can feed all of that into a model and say, actually, you know what? I'm not going to play the DM game. I'm going to let a model do it for me that's been trained on how I've done it for the past thousand times and it can kind of pretend to be you it can answer questions the way you would answer questions and then if when it doesn't know an answer it could notify the real you and say hey keegan this guy asked a question i don't know the answer do you want to step in um and then ultimately it could have access to your calendly it could book in an appointment with this person to get to the the real thing and just save you a lot of time maybe on on kind of dm chains that don't go anywhere um so that's just like one example off the top of my head another one for coaches that i think would be super powerful um I know that I've done a lot of health coaching again, like Keegan mentioned with Dave. Um, I've been a client of Dave's. I've been a client of another guy who I think is great called Jake and, and um, work working with those two. We end up communicating a lot in voice notes. So I have like on my WhatsApp, I have this huge collection of a year's worth of voice notes with these health coaches. Um, and they've told me all kinds of amazingly helpful things, but sometimes it's really difficult for me to, um, you know, if it, I can't just go to this thing, hey, what was that thing that Dave said to me about um, about 
NAC a year ago, um, because it's all contained within these voice notes that are hard to search. But you could vectorize all of that stuff and then just say, hey, what was that thing that Dave was telling me about NAC? And it could not only could it give you the answer of what he said to me a year ago from the sea of voice notes that we have, but it could also say, here's the link to the voice note and the the, the minute timestamp of when he said it. Um, so I think that's really powerful, both for kind of coaches and their clients, because you as a coach might think, oh, what was that person asking me about, like how how I could help them with their shoulder? I remember I gave them a really good answer um, and it could just find it for you or even more so um, if you've got all of that knowledge in the form of voice note history, you could say, hey, write me a blog post based on what I have told people um, about fixing their shoulders. And it could just kind of find all that relevant information, create a post for you, create some content, which you can put on Instagram, Twitter, wherever else. Um, and it can all be based on your way of doing things, your way of seeing seeing the world and seeing your the body, your profession, you know. Yeah. Yeah. This, that's huge. I'll, I'd love to talk about this a lot more. I, I, the one more question, and I want to go to, because Eugene's got a bunch of questions and uh, oh. I'm sure others are curious and I'd like to hear other perspectives. What What is your technical background? Did I miss that? Or did, Yeah. No, sorry. I didn't really introduce hard. myself. Did I? So um, I'm Martin, by the way, thank you for listening to me for the last 45 minutes. Um, so I've, I'm a technical lead and software engineer. I've been kind of, building and leading remote technical teams for about 15 years thereabouts. Um, and so I've built kind of software as a service applications. I've kind of worked in, um, I, I actually worked in the AI space about four years ago. I led a team of um, machine learning and natural language processing engineers. Um, and this was, even though it was only three, four years ago, this was a very different iteration of AI to what we see today. Um, but we were basically working on tools for data, data analysts. It ended up being kind of going down a little bit of a military rabbit hole. So we were working with kind of data analysts in the military to be able to predict um, events and locations and, and things like that. Um, I kind of stepped out of the AI world for a little while, ended up working for a, a blockchain company called IOHK, who um, they built Cardano, which is like quite a famous cryptocurrency in that in that space. So I was working there, leading a team there. Um, and very recently, like within the last couple of weeks, I've left um, IOHK and I'm just kind of doing my own thing, consulting in the AI and large language model space. I was uh, I was buying Cardano at four cents based on a Uber nice drive, dude. Uber <laughs> nice. tip. So yeah, yeah. Really work. Uh, I yeah. Anyway, there's a, a whole other story with crypto world, but um, yeah, cool. That's yeah, it, very very interesting background and cool to see you've continued sort of evolving and testing new things as as the space evolves. Yeah, yeah. And what would you what would you like to ask here? What's relevant to you? Don't feel as though you need to have a big background in this because I certainly don't. I'm a rugby strength coach at the at the base. Uh, what's what's coming up for you here? I just uh, wanted yeah, to ask, can. getting back to embeddings uh, concept and chatbots. Uh, do I understand right that, for example, when you have conversation with some of AIs and you just print it some text and you teach it, it works like this embeddings. You give it a text, it interprets uh, exact extract meaning from it and just uh, get it uh, appended to its knowledge base, right? Yes, essentially, yeah. I mean, it depends on the application you're working with, but most of the, I would say 90, 95% of the applications that you find today um, that are using AI in a like large language model capacity, they're using this embedding retrieval strategy in, in some way. Um, and actually, you can use this same embedding retrieval strategies in ways you might not initially think about. So one example that I've been working on for a company relatively recently is they wanted a, a, an AI that could interact with a really large database that runs their, um, their software as a service application. So for them, they work with kind of like email leads and, and salesy stuff, recruitment, all of that type of stuff. And, and they wanted to be able to, they wanted their users to be able to ask a question of the database. So they like, maybe the user could say, 
how many emails did did people open last week that we sent out and but also that they were based in texas and you know whatever like weird kind of custom question they want to answer and the the ai can kind of interact with the database understand all the different tables available to it and come up with the answer um and part of the way it does that is using these embeddings where you say kind of like you give a load of examples of like, oh, if you want to know this about the data, if you want to know that about the data, here's the kind of query that you'd put together or here's the kind of query you'd put together in that case. So you're just feeding the model relevant code and it then learns how to interact with the database based on the relevant code you've provided as embeddings. So sorry, that's a long answer, but yeah, yes is the answer. Yeah, yeah it's cool. It's, it's really, <laughs> I say also much more questions to bombard you with, but want to others go first since they also have questions. Hey, Chris, you got your hand up there, mate. Yeah. Uh, hi, hi, Martin. Uh, good to see you, great presentation. Uh, in the beginning, you were talking about how the challenge right now is the information going into the different models. Um, and if we were to look at the situation of say current medical information in the last couple of years that we weren't looking to have included in our question, can you use that and say uh, in the prompt, uh, you're a medical expert from say 2019 uh, to get uh, information if that, uh, if you were looking for something like that, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting question. What it, so what it makes me think of, and, and apologies if this doesn't answer directly, but um, my cousin actually does some work in, he works in a similar space to me. Um, and he he was very, very involved. I don't know, Keegan, how like how how much I can go into this stuff here or not. I'm assuming I can, given your, um, your kind of clientele, but he, my cousin worked a lot in the in the vaccine world and just kind of trying to expose a lot of what was going on during that whole pandemic and and some of the the controversy controversial like stuff that was happening um he ended up getting quite big in that space and he built this kind of ai or he's building this ai now out where you can basically feed the AI, like here's a link to um, 10 papers that make the case that, that um, you know, the vaccines associated with myocarditis and the risk is way worse, um, way worse than the potential benefit. And then you can talk with the model based on those specific papers that have kind of like the back up that case. And you can actually get it to give you some, because you obviously can't do that with chat GPT because it's so heavily controlled to give a certain outcome. Um, but when you provide it the real data and say, hey, look at this data, what do you think? Um, it will give you an honest answer. Um, so you can kind of like, you know, and you can do that in a really honest way where you provide it a load of papers on both sides and say, what do you really think? What's going on? Or you can do that in a more dishonest way and just cherry pick papers to, to for it to give you an answer that you want it to. Um, so, yeah, it's really interesting, but you certainly can get it to adopt different personas with a different kind of um, they each have different um a different handle or a different set of knowledge that they're working from. And in fact, one of the things that he and I were just playing around with is actually getting the two AIs to de debate one another. So you could have one AI that's fed like a load of traditional, like the, the status quo narrative of how vaccines are working in the body and their risk profile. And you can have another AI that's trained on all of the like other side of the coin and just get them to talk to each other and see what happens. Yeah, great. Uh, another kind of question here. Yeah, hearing your different ideas would sound fantastic from a trainer perspective, looking to build a site and being able to manage all that information so well. Uh, it feels like too good to be true. Is there just certain steps? And it seems like data collection is really the most important and the the thing that cannot be slacked on and like you have to get into the people or you know i guess you could find other ways if you're having the ai or say instagram try to like funnel emails or capture it from other ways but uh 
you know, th- what steps in there are going to be really the most pivotal. And then like the machines do the work for you if it's not just data collection. Thank yeah, it's a, great, it's a great question, Chris. And I think you've actually kind of hit on the answer yourself, which is that you just need to be thinking about collecting data, whether that's your knowledge, like that's one piece of data that's helpful, right? It's just my knowledge about my industry or the way I do things. Um, but there's also just think about anytime you're you're doing something that involves data in in any format, video, text, um, audio, wherever, just think about like what value could be extracted from this data if I had the right technology and forget whether the technology exists. So, you know, my email history with prospective clients, that's all actually really valuable because if the technology was there to be able to say, here's how I email people, do it for me, like pretend to be me in my emails and then ask me if you've got any questions about how you should respond, um, that is going to be possible. And and just kind of like, I guess the way I would think about it is like back when I started, I was 16 when I started building websites and I was just started building for friends and family and ended up kind of having my own little business building websites and things. Back then when I was 16 years old, um, that was a skill that you had to hire someone to do. If you wanted a website, you had to hire someone and they would build it for you. Um, and, And that's kind of where we are at today with this stuff is if you have this like amazing data set or you have this interesting idea, you need to hire someone like me to create it. But just like with the web, we will evolve to the point where, you know, Squarespace becomes a thing and Wix becomes a thing. And now today you can just go and do a website yourself unless you need something really like complicated and bespoke. You don't really need to hire someone like me. Um, and that same thing will happen with AI. Like the the tools, they're already becoming available now. Like I know, Keegan, you've been playing with uh, chat base and things like that to kind of synthesize bots based on um, a certain amount of knowledge. And that's like, that's already here to Today. And those tools are going to get better. They're going to get broader. Like at some point in time, 100%, there'll be a tool out there that is precisely for creating a sales bot based on how you interact with people. That's going to be a thing. Um, and so if you've already got the data available and ready to feed into it, then you've got a head start on everyone else. Wow. Um, Caesar, you got your hand up. Um, hi, Martin. Very, very quite a uh, nice uh, expo. I think it uh, for me is like uh, you know it it only shows the possibilities are huge. But I want to ask you not about the expo, but what are your thoughts about a career like uh, this is so new and this is so big and profound that uh, do you need to be a computer science a, a you know engineer or what are your thoughts about, about uh, changing to a new profession like uh, Ch- ChatGPT prompter? Uh, you you told really us good, that you have, a, you have a, a, a lot of background, but you yeah, know, yeah. I'm a coach for 15 years and my career is in, on that, but I have my uh, kid, he's only 15. And for sure, I, I know that he's willing to do economics, but maybe having a a very good course on this could be a game changer in this point of time. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think there's a lot of layers to it. And the first thing I'll say is like, you know, I've got a lot to learn myself about how to how to be very successful in the world. So I'm still on this journey with you guys. So I don't want to talk as an authority in in kind of creating financial stability and freedom for oneself. Um, But what I will say, just from what I can see, is that um, is that I think there's a couple of layers to it. I think that you should just do what you do and you should do what you do really well. That's my take on it. It's like, if you're, if you're a coach and that's what you love and that's what you're good at, then that's exactly what you should do. But on, on top of that, I think that everyone would benefit from learning how to prompt really well, because it's just going to become a bigger part of our life. Like th- this stuff is going to be more and more present as we move forwards. So it's only going to pay to be able to use it really well. It's like, but even back in the day, right? Like if you, like I remember when, when I used the internet for the first time, I didn't grow up with the internet. I was like, oh, this is a new thing and I'm going to use it. And, um, 
being able to Google stuff wasn't like something that everyone could just do back then. People couldn't just find information on the internet. But today, like, it's a skill that everyone needs and everyone has to have and everyone develops because it's an absolute necessity. So you might as well, like, get a bit of a head start and learn learn about it and learn about it now and, and be in that place where it just gives you an edge. It gives you one more edge over the rest of the market is that you're this amazing coach that also knows how to use technology to his advantage. But no, I certainly don't think you need to be a computer scientist or learn learn really good fundamental computer science. Like I actually have never done a computer science course in my life. And there's stuff that when I build out teams, there are people I hire on my teams who are amazing computer scientists who would just blow me out of the water with their technical knowledge. But like we all inhabit our own little function, don't we? And um, and and I just don't think you need that to be able to use these tools really well. Like obviously I've learned to program and I've learned to build things over the years and taught myself, but um, there is that kind of fundamental that I'll never have. Um, I, but but similarly for you, like you don't need to like understand the the nuts and bolts of how you build something like this in order to be able to use it effectively. Um, but I do think if you're thinking about your your kids and stuff, like for sure, like just it's something they should learn is how to use this stuff really well and really creatively. Um, and for me, I actually um, I, I I'm a nerd, so maybe I'm an outlier, but I find this stuff really interesting because i think that it actually doesn't require um a very mathematical analytical brain to do this stuff really well you don't need to understand the science i think working with these models it's really like the intersection of art and science like it really is as much of an art as it is a science and maybe more so like, like coming up with good prompts to achieve certain things it's a very creative process i find Thanks. You're welcome. Um, Eugene. Uh, you know? Also, sure. Also, I got, uh, sorry, uh, if there's someone. Uh, no, you go ahead, I can ask. Ah, Okay. Um, the thing that I saw is that maybe with Paul Council, you do like, a, you can ask Paul Council. And also with Keegan, he already has a vault. So he has a lot of information. Uh, but in the future, maybe people can print humans and put a AI. So it's like, you know, it's like X-Men, like, or like, you know, science fiction, but it's like, it's, we are very, very close to, to this is the, 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 the uses of these technologies. Like, wow. Yeah. What are your mean, thoughts on that? I, I mean, ultimately I have no idea, but what I can tell you in like, I think things are going to get really weird. I think things are going to get really weird for a little while while we, while we figure this stuff out and while this stuff grows. I mean, even just like, I know this is a pretty basic app that I've put in front of you guys today as an example, but if I'd have showed you this two years ago, like everyone's minds would have been blown. Like, I was like, what is this? Is magic. Um, but this is what we can do today. And that that's happened so quickly and I think it only stands to reason that this growth is going to continue to be exponential and, and who knows where it leads. I have no idea. I think there's much bigger conversations that we could have about, you know, the nature of consciousness and what it means to be sentient and all of that stuff um, that kind of, yeah, my gut feeling, and this is just me as like, I'm ultimately an optimist, but I, my feeling is that things are going to get really weird and then it's going to be a good thing. I think it's going to come around to be a really positive force um, in the world, ultimately. Um, but maybe I'm just uh, being optimistic. Yeah, so I wanted to ask, uh, previously you said that, for example, you can uh, program your bot, uh, your AI to work with leads, to send you some message that, for example, some user answered you that. And I wonder what are tools for connecting your AI with your code? For example, I want if a user something said something to my AI, like the, he he's a lead, how my AI can, for example, open some page, press that, press that, press that. How can I execute other code then interconnect it? That's what's interesting for me. 
Yeah, it's a great question. So what you're talking about, and, and you'll hear the term, if you speak to kind of programmers in the AI space, you're talking about agentic um, AI. So basically, a, an agent in the in the AI terms, like this is this is a very simple application in that you know you give it some prompt and it comes up with some output. Um, but agents are different. They have um, it's similar to to this. It's using the same tools under the hood, um, but instead of just spitting back some text and sending that straight to the user. The agent has access to a number of tools that you build for it. So maybe one of those tools that you build is a, um, a, a Google search. So the agent can search the internet for some information. Maybe one of those tools you build is a um, is a Instagram API integration. So it can send a DM for you on your behalf. And then basically you say to the agent, like given this scenario, this input, um, use the tools that you think are most suitable for the scenario. And then it will just continually, basically they continually iterate. So that the, the first thing it would output rather than something that the user would see is it would output something like, hey, um, you know, Eugene asked me to find out how many people live in Sydney and then post that to my Instagram account. It would go, okay, what tools do I have available to me? I have Google. So I'm going to find, I'm going to do a Google search for how many people live in Sydney. That pops back and that gets fed back into the prompt and it goes, okay, I now know how many people live in Sydney. I have this other tool available to me, which is make an Instagram DM or a post or whatever. And then it can use that and feed the information into that. And, and right now, those agentic interactions are like very much so you'd need someone who can like program that out and build that out. Um, but again, over time, like we're going to see these things get more democratized. Like Zapier is a really good, I don't know if you've used Zapier or Zapier, I don't know how you say it, but that's kind of like a tool that people can use to, to stitch APIs together without coding knowledge. But that's going to start happening in the AI space with these agents and things like that. And you'll be able to sort of drag and drop an agent into place given the tools you want it to be able to use. Yeah, it makes sense. Thanks. You can also check chat. There's also many questions that we got it. Sorry, may you say that again? You can also check chat. There's also many questions that. Oh, cool. Yeah, I haven't actually looked. Let me stop sharing my screen and I'll um, I'll look in the chat. Yeah, so the question about Instagram chat, exactly like Eugene said, it just depends on whether that platform has an API that you can tie into. So really simply, an API is just, um, let's say I'm running Instagram, I as Instagram create a set of tools that developers can use to interact with my data. So any of these products that have an API, and not all of them do, um, we can interact with in some way to explore all of this data. Um, I mean, and kind of, uh, a step back from that, you could also just hire someone on Fiverr to copy paste all the data into a Notion thing for you or something like that, but they might be there a long time. Um, and some examples on a public repo. Yeah, I absolutely do. I've got some publicly available um, work. I'm, I, there's a popular framework in the AI space called Langchain, um, and I've made a few open source contributions to that. Um, I built a, I don't know if any of you have used Slack where you, in your work, it's just like a communication platform for teams. Um, I built an open source like Slack chat GPT integration so you can talk with this custom data through Slack rather than just on a website somewhere. Um, I'll, I'll post some stuff in the um, in the AI channel. If everyone's on that on Telegram, after this, I'll post like a bit of some, some links to my work. And uh, also I'll post the link to the presentation so you guys can look through it in your own time as well. Um, you have a look. Prompt structure recommendations. Yeah, prompt structure recommendations. I would, the first thing I would do is, is go on that link that's in the presentation and just understand a few of those terms. So understand zero shot prompting, few shot prompting, plan and solve, like just know what those things mean. And they sound complicated, but they're really not. So like zero shot is just, hey, ChatGPT, I want you to do this thing. Um, few shot is, hey, ChatGPT, I want you to do this thing. Here's an example of what that might look like, like what you should come back with. Um, plan and solve is like 
telling it to kind of, hey, chat GPT, I need you to come up with a plan of how we would do this, come up with it in steps, show me the steps and then solve the problem. Um, and that can be a really helpful tactic when you're working with more um, numerical stuff, stuff where it can get a bit lost in the weeds. Um, but I, I guess what I would say is, is check out that, um, check out that link. And also don't be just play with this stuff. Like if, if you're trying to use chat GPT for something and, and it just isn't giving you what you want, rather than go like, oh, chat GPT can't do this. Um, in many cases it can, you just have to be creative with how you prompt it. So just have that attitude of, um, oh, I can probably do this if I find the right prompt. Um, let me see if that's, there's anything else. The question, Eugene, around the plugins and things like that, exactly, they're all using the same embedding strategy under, under the hood. Unless the only thing that wouldn't be using an embedding strategy is if someone's either built their own model from scratch or if they fine-tuned the model, um, which, again, very few people in the space are doing just because it ends up oftentimes not working very well. Um, prompting for no hallucinations, the, the best in a, in a quick a quick word that the the easiest way to to get the model not to hallucinate is to provide it some data to work with like we've seen and then explicitly say if you cannot find the answer in the data that i provide to you just tell me you can't find the answer that solves a lot of the hallucination problem um and yeah PyTorch, TensorFlow, definitely the tools of the trade for like proper ML stuff, um, but certainly not needed for what, what I've showed you in that demo or what we're doing with embeddings. That's much simpler tooling, just a basic grasp of either JavaScript or Python, and you can get to you can get to that level pretty, pretty quick. Um, I think that's everything in the chat. Um, yes. And I think we might have gone over a little bit. Keegan, um, did you have anything you wanted to ask or anything else before we close out? Who who would you say are the leaders in this space? Because you know, I've listened a little bits and pieces around things, but you, you've gone pretty pretty deep on things there, and you've been able to demonstrate an output of something that I'm not seeing many customers and many companies proving that they can do what you've just shown us that you can do with the uh, Paul's Paul's work, for example, like saying that really works and showing exactly where the video stuff is. Like, yeah. I haven't seen anyone that's doing that yet. Um, how yeah who who are the leaders in the space and sort of how how many people would you say have something like your skill set at the moment yeah it's a good question keegan cuz cuz honestly i don't actually know the answer to who are the leaders i think we're all kind of like some of us developers who are interested in this stuff we're all kind of figuring it out as we go like for example, I know that you've used Chatbase, which is becoming really, really popular. It's a fantastic tool. Um, but the guy who created Chatbase, Yasser, um, who I've met a couple of times, he was just a computer science student in Toronto that was just like, oh, I could build this cool thing. And there it is. It's turned into this huge company. He's making a load of money. And he's a funny character, Yasser, because he's very open about like the money he's making and what he's doing. Like He's really using it as an experiment to teach people about the exact kind of stuff that you talk about, Keegan, about how to get financially free and all of that stuff so he's an interesting guy there's a lot of other people in the space i i would just say i think the reason you're not seeing more of this stuff more quickly is i think it requires like an intersection of a skill set which is partly technical but also on the other side highly creative like you really need to be quite creatively oriented to come up with this stuff um there are certainly people doing it but I just think it's new enough that the sort of leaders haven't really emerged yet. I kind of hope to be one. Are you working for yourself in this space or what, like, what's your, what do you do? Yeah. My, my situation right now is that I'm, I'm working for myself. Um, I've literally just started. So I've been doing contracting work alongside my full-time job for the last six months or so. Um, I've just quit the full-time job to do this full-time. Um, I've got a few clients I'm working for. I've got one client who I'm trying to close a kind of longer term contract with that will kind of form the backbone. I don't really have to think about money at that point. Um, but I'm also thinking like quite deeply about what products do I want to put together and, and really put out into the world? Like, for example, what I just showed you, I think there's a product there. Like anyone can plug in their video course and pop out one of those chatbots. That's a big value add for people. So there's a, there's a lot of opportunity right now.
Yeah, Chris is asking uh, something along those lines of uh, what would your fee be to build things like you described? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it really it really depends. It really depends on like how big is the data set? Like what is it you want the thing to do? Um, one of the things like, so the thing I've just showed you, right? That's ultimately, it's really cool. And I think it's really valuable, but it's ultimately a toy. Like it could definitely get things wrong. It could definitely lead people down the wrong path. So I think you have to be really conscious about the difference between something that's like highly productionized and we could put out there into the world. It's like, um, it's why Keegan, when, I, when we were talking about Dave and his health knowledge and everything, why my mind goes to initially, oh, this should be a tool for practitioners. Just because right now the technology is such that I think you could land yourself in hot water if you were giving it straight to the public and it got something wrong. And it was like, you know, it gave you some horrible supplement recommendation, at a terrible dose that starts messing people up. Um but but yeah, the, the pricing is very dependent on on what needs to be done. And uh, I guess I'm still trying to figure that out with various various clients. Well, what what I'll probably do is uh, request another meeting with you and maybe we could talk about some of your ideas and really the direction of where I should begin my data collection and find mm -hmm. more you know the useful direction of where it's going. So um you know, it's just his focus. I, I don't know, just like you at the time of where it's going to go, but uh, knowing that there needs to be this big sweep of collection, it can allow me the freedom of just kind of like, you know, a lot of testing, a lot of giving away and just like uh, while the, over the next six months or year, it's accumulating and kind of like working on itself and, and feeding like a growing, uh, like beautiful beast. So uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I'm um, uh, reaching I'm out. Booked out for the next six months. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll have a talk. We'll have a talk about that. We do need to get like the premium, uh, you know, the services going again within the common success. We had it in the past where it was easy to book consults and such. Yeah, and we're looking at bringing that back as well, so we can, you know, respect everyone's time and and knowledge. And I'm sure if people want to chat life and training and and nutrition and stuff but it's different if you're a real leader in your field i mean you can do what you want to do you can you can definitely do the short consults and such but um yeah that professional side of things is going to kick off again within uncom that you know we can facilitate more work together and um yeah chris is first in so you know he'll be fine but just for, for everybody, we can't uh we can expect martin to jump on a, a call and map everyone's ai billion dollar business uh together with us so but uh yeah that, that that was fantastic like that was really i've been curious about this thing since it started uh, yeah. ben Ruan actually put me on to chat gpt and the first questions i asked it about three four five i don't know when it like not too long after it came out like i had heard about it once maybe and i just ignored it and then ben works for us um and he said, you need to check this out and i asked it like what do you think about liver you know what, what do you think about the carnival diet like yeah. these were questions that I was throwing to it straight away, asking like some political questions. And I was really curious about the ideology of the thing, right? Like if it's. Yeah, that's me too. Those are the first questions I asked as well. It's all ideology stuff, like trying to get it to give me, yeah, confirm my conspiracy theories for me. <laughs> yeah. I think some of the people who were really early to it got some really interesting stuff. I think it was telling people how to make bombs and, and all yeah, sorts. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. You have to be really careful, man. Like I, I built an, a bot, which I'll show to you guys in, in the link as well. But I don't know, some of you might have heard of Ram Dass. He was like quite a famous spiritual Ooh. teacher. Yeah. So I built this bot based on all of Ram Dass's work. And um, it's actually, I'm, I'm really proud of it. It gives such good answers. If you tell it like, hey, Ram Dass, here's what's going on in my life. It'll give you some really good advice. But one of the problems I ran into early on, because I was obviously monitoring stuff to just keep an eye on what it was doing and, and what it was saying, and Ramdas wrote this book about dying, and um, it, it kind of frames dying in a very like spiritual, beautiful way, very nuanced, right? And someone, of course, asked this, told this bot that they were thinking about killing themselves, and it gave this answer that made it sound like beautiful. I'm like, no, don't, you can't say that to people. Like, so you have to be really careful on how it communicates because it's not a human. It doesn't have the same filters we do. And, you know, in some contexts, if you're talking to an old person and they're terminally ill, like, yeah, frame it as 
beautiful then and it's a stage of life and it's a just a phase into a new thing but if someone's talking about ending their life you you have to say hey i don't know what i'm talking about here's the number you need to call to go and get help don't end your own life um so yeah that is it's just an example of how how yeah how we really need to think about these things when we're putting them out into the world Eugene, Eugene wants to share something there just before we, we finish sure. up. I wanted to ask exactly about this. Have you polished the bots after you fed him the info? So this situation, they can pop up like uh, infinitely, indefinitely. And have you fixed this? How we approach this problem uh, to yeah. make it? It's a great question. Uh, there's two two approaches. Um, there, actually, there's a bunch of different approaches, but the two, the first two to consider are one is obviously just adding something into the prompt. If it's really important and it needs to do it, respect that every time. Add it into the prompt. Um, so you'd say, as part of the prompt, you'd say, "Hey, if someone asks about killing themselves, just say you have no idea what you should say to this person. I'm not trained to deal with this. I'm I'm an AI." Um, or for the exactly as you said these things can be indefinite you can end up with edge cases that run indefinitely you can actually create an embedding for it so you can embed the question oh what should i do if i kill myself and then give it the answer of if someone asks this this is what you say store it as an embedding so then when it gets asked it will always surface as one of the most relevant embeddings and it'll always be injected into the prompt for you um so those are the two main strategies and there's also um you can have more like QA layers. So it, there's there's one project we're working on, for example, this database agent. Um, the database also contains within it some very sensitive data that if surfaced would would cause a great problem for the company. So we have a, a like a number of post-processing agents. So large language models who get the answer the model provides gets fed into another agent and that agent's job is to say hey is there any sensitive information in this answer before we then give it to the user and it has a load of specific instructions around how to recognize that so it's someone at the door my dog's going on that's one second. all right we're gonna we're gonna wrap it there that was fantastic i do want to just say because we spoke about some darkness there with uh, rammed us and you know many of us have had dark times i want to bring the the focus back to the light that there is so much to look forward to i think everyone in uncommon success feels that of like if anyone ever is having dark times or anyone who listens to this video like there are literally hundreds of men here who will have a conversation with you you can go and fly to and go and hang out with for a bit you can go to one of the villages in montenegro or vanuatu like we're building the ultimate support network the thing i shared in the connected chat today about uh, I was talking about how like half half the men now, you know, sort of feel like they're not needed. And, you know, a third of men haven't had sex in the last 12 months. And it's not about sex as the physical act. It's, it's the feeling of like, I'm not needed in society and I'm not, not wanted and I'm useless. Like that is a tough place to live from. And it's talking about how that can be really bad for a man when they're, when they're thinking like that and they can do silly things. And I, I think I know something of what that feels like. I, I don't know if I was ever in the bottom 50%, but I know I was I was a lonely teen and, you know, I've been through the tough times. Like we have something very, very beautiful and very powerful here with with this network and this group. And, you know, anyone who listens to this and and uh, is thinking about, oh, they kept the negatives with this or, you know, uh, going through challenging times, like there's there's so much here to look forward to. And uh, I, I love the, that we're building this network where you do become more valuable. And the, the biggest take home from that podcast was like, yeah, be, be successful, like get, get more money and do good things. And then, you know, you'll get through to, um, you know, having, having a better life and being more, you know, being more valuable. If you, you know, getting sex is, is one of the outcomes, but it's like so much bigger than that. Um, and so, yeah, I, uh, I think we should finish on that, on that positive side for anyone who's, worrying about what uh, Ramdas has to say, but um, <laughs> thank you so much, Martin. Like that was just, yeah, so, so powerful. We've all been sort of hearing little bits and pieces about it, but you've brought it home in such a clear way of there are really important, actionable things here and everyone's going to be heavily influenced by it. So, you know, we, we might as well continue to learn about it and learn from, uh, you know, learn from yourself, but um, know that it's, know that it's going to continue to grow and, you know, make, plans and considerations based on that because it's it's very very unlikely that anything's going to slow down with this technology in the near future um, yeah thanks so much thanks guys jumping in asking questions as well
Yeah, thank you guys. It's been a been a pleasure and thanks for making the space for this, Keegan. I really appreciate it.